records. We have a great uh, team uh, judging them. And every year, these awards make a dent in the ways different people with different sets of values and different sets of eyes know how to push and say, I can make things better in this own way. And by letting all of these flowers bloom and different people's ideas come to the fore, the McNulty Prize, I think, has inspired each one of us to figure out, oh, that's a different way of doing things. That's a really cool way of doing things. I think that uh, if we look at this action forum, we look at what the Aspen Institute's all about, it's keeping an open mind and admiring each step and each way that people try to make it in this world. And so that's why I always look forward to hearing about the runners up, as well as the nominees, as well as the McNulty Prize winners. So let me present Ann McNulty and Secretary Madeleine Albright, who is one of the judges. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Walter, and thank you, Anand, for that really thoughtful, provoking speech. Um, uh, I have a special fondness for the 10,000 Women Project, so, <laughs> but I did appreciate the humor. Um, so anyway, I am really happy to be here today. This is always a real special day for us. Um, so as I thought about today's announcement of this year's McNulty Laureates, um, it really is a happy day. And I thought about all that this prize has meant to me and to my children. My son Johnny is here with us today. And my daughter Bryn and son Kevin. Uh, for all of us, it has been great over the years to get to know all of these phenomenal people, not just the laureates, but everyone in the program who's putting projects together and trying to make a difference. So when I was thinking of today's announcement, I did try to think of different stories about John. And so I did think of one which talked about when he was building his business against great odds. And this was written about in a book called The Partnership. And the author, a guy by the name of Charlie Ellis, quoted John as he talked about the early days of building a business against all odds. Building a business that really would become an incredibly successful business. So I would like to read this to you. As an expert observer of firm politics, McNulty viewed his career with engagingly sardonic good humor. This may be our last job at the firm, he told his team. We are pioneers. And you know what pioneers do. They come up with the ideas. They blaze the path. They take all the big risks. Years later, folks build statues to celebrate the pioneers that no one can remember by name. And then the pigeons come and shit all over them. So I said, so that's really our destiny, pigeon shit. <laughs> so I like the story because it shows in many, many things about John. Obviously his ambition and his drive, his sense of destiny as a pioneer, his great confidence that he with others would succeed, his humor and ironically, a little bit of humility about what it all would mean. And I love that he really was giving that message to his team saying, we are all going to do great things together even if people later will not remember our names. So all of you are pioneers. Those of us in the world of social change or social impact or whatever term we want to use, we all do worry about this problem of how do you move the needle to really solve the world's most difficult problems? How can you address intractable problems? I know all of you have discussed this for hours around seminar tables. I know here at the forum, a lot of you have discussed it. I know people have already been writing their ideas again on the pledges, the action pledges on the walls outside. How can we ch drive change in a way that really does change the system? Clearly, we can't go it alone. 
It's clear that no one set of actors can do it. Business alone clearly cannot do it. So we have business, government, NGOs, and not-for-profits all have to work together. That's a lot of what I know all of you have talked about the last two days, um, agreeing or disagreeing, about the power of collaboration, you know, thoughtful, sophisticated collaboration across sectors um, as a key to getting things done. I think you will see with this year's McNulty laureates that in each case, their success has been really tied to their ability to get others committed with them to action across sectors. Each of them has had this great ambition to change the system. Each of them has great ambition and will change the system. My husband, John, was a big personality, and he was a man of action. It's really what he was all about. He did have the vision to take what was really a sleepy stepchild business in a very large investment bank and make it bigger than anyone at the time could have imagined. When he took it over, it had a few hundred people. And in the course of the first year, he doubled that and kept adding out that after that. It's a business that now does not have 10 billion people, but has many thousands of people. He built this whole dynamic new team in part by going against the existing culture, by hiring stars from competitors, and notably by hiring a number of incredibly talented women. And like all of you, he relentlessly advocated for his group to get resources. He fought the battle to protect his group from all the doubters and the critics. And he set out the great ambition, the very clear ambition, that this very relatively small US-based business would become a global enterprise. And that all this team working with him could take pride in that, even as, as he said, people later would not remember their names. So my children and I created this prize to celebrate these qualities, um, which do bear repeating. First of all, a pioneering spirit thinking big, setting out ambitious goals, and fighting for what you believe in. So we created this prize really for all of you, pioneers who we think do make a difference, are making a difference, and we think really that will live on. So I am pleased to present a wonderful video a Lodge, the head of my foundation, who is here with me as well, is really the director, producer, and creative talent be behind these amazing videos. Um, so we will introduce this year's laureates through the video. I think making positive change is an imperative for me. It's, it's what drives me, and I think it is my life's work. I can't imagine a higher calling than trying to figure out how to preserve our future source of economy and culture while making sure people can feed their kids today. For me, it's much more than, than a job, than an initiative or a project, it's my call. Leadership is a vital ingredient for positive change and I think the McNulty Prize affirms and, and rewards and encourages people to stand up and be counted as leaders. We're proving that we can change the way fishermen fish, repopulate fish stocks, put food on the table, and boost local economies. The question was, could we inspire whole countries to change the way they fish? or the way they farm. That's the inspiration for Fish Forever. NutriVida is using the tools of the market to get good quality food to every single table. We want to eradicate undernutrition in the region. I think that a society is unsustainable when 
half its youth aren't in productive economy. Harambi transitions young unemployed South Africans into their first jobs. What young people want most is a job, and the reason is that it gives them the autonomy and the agency to shape their own lives and realise their own potential. The markets often create poverty, environmental degradation and destroy communities. I think we have the power to address this injustice of inequality. B-Lab is a nonprofit that's trying to redefine success in business so that all companies compete to be best for the world. We all have the capacity to do something so much more meaningful than simply run our businesses. When you realize that you have the capacity through your network, through the skills you have in your organization, how can you not put everything you have into it? We sometimes underestimate how many resources and what a big platform we have to affect change. We've been given great gifts. The question is how we're going to use them now. If we don't do this, we're not sure anyone else will. Fantastic. So, as I said, it's so heartwarming for us, you know, to, to see and to, to get to know each of you. It's really fantastic. Um, but before we invite this year's laureates to the stage, I also want to recognize um, several people. Uh, one of our judges, I believe, is here, although I can't pick him out, Alaro Atuno. Ah, there's Alaro. Thank you. Also, we have many McNulty laureates in the audience who have been pioneers in creating change. Um, so along with Adele Olajedi, if you will each stand so we can see you. Adele will be moderating our panel shortly. Uh, we also have Patrick Awua. Is Patrick here? Uh, there he is. <laughs> Amit Bhatia. Meridad Bagai. Hey, hi, Meridad. Manoj Kumar. Mm -hmm. Lana Abu Hijle. Hildegard Vasquez. And Diego de Sola. Our special family. Um, now, I have a very special privilege of introducing a personal hero of mine uh, who has also become a friend over the years, uh, someone who stepped up in a unique way to serve her nation and the world, a truly inspiring leader, Secretary Madeleine Albright. Now, as you know, she had a phenomenal world leadership role while she was in government. Since leaving government, she has not really had a quiet retirement. She has written many best-selling books, including Prague Winter, which is an extraordinary tale of her life story. And she has continued to use her platform in many ways to advocate for others. Um, I recently had the opportunity to travel to Colombia with Madam Secretary and with a delegation that she was uh, meeting with the current president and the opposition leadership to talk about and advance the tenuous uh, negotiations for peace in Colombia. So I have to tell you, it is very impressive to see Secretary Albright in action. She was very deft in dealing with what you can imagine is some very strong egos in Colombia. You know, so she's very smooth, very effective in dealing with that. And as you know, along with an incredible resume, with Madeline, it's really not all work and no play. She engaged last year in a very funny Twitter war with Conan O'Brien. 
I don't know if all of you have heard about that. Uh, they got engaged in different Twitters about their respective Halloween costumes. And the Twitter world really did declare that Madeline was the winner. Madeline was the funnier one. And she said one of her last tweets was, never start a war of words with a diplomat. <laughs> this past spring, she appeared in an episode of the popular comedy show Parks and Recreation. And this fall, you can see her in an episode of Madam Secretary. So, and in addition, for those of you who would like to follow her, her Twitter handle is at Madeline. <laughs> so I am pleased to introduce Secretary Madam Albright. Thank you very much, Anne. It's really terrific to be here. And to have an opportunity to participate in this again. Let me just say, I listened very carefully to what Armour had to say, and I grew up in Colorado. I am an immigrant. I came to this country when I was 12 years old, and I'm a grateful immigrant. And every time I drive up here, which I do, uh, at risk to all on the road, uh, <laughs> I think to myself, what a gorgeous state it is, what a wonderful country it is, and how complicated it is to come to Aspen to talk about poverty. And so I thank you for raising the issues that you raised. But I would like to say that in the work that Aspen does, I think we really do do an awful lot of good and a lot of justice. And I'm very proud to be a member of the Aspen board and to be a part of this community. Uh, I, I think this very, uh, session and all looking out at all of you that are part of the Action Forum. I look forward to participating uh, in some of the breakout sessions tomorrow and to really have a chance to explore ideas of leadership and individual responsibility and to have the opportunity to talk to people who want to make a difference, to do no harm, and to do justice. So it's my pleasure to be here and it is my honor to know Anne McNulty. We really have done an awful lot of things together. Uh, a lot of them fun, a lot of them very serious, and a lot of them that do a lot of good. I do find that, in fact, being one of the judges may be one of the more difficult jobs I've ever been assigned uh, because the people that submit their ideas are so remarkable and trying to make choices. I know, Alara, you, you feel the same way when we have the meetings, how really hard it is to decide who is the, this year's person and how we do it. And so we really do look for innovative projects that are going to make a, a lasting contribution that goes beyond the project itself. And for instance, I mean, and you pointed some of them out, but eyeglasses, investigative journalism, job training, education, things that have a multiplier effect in terms of improvements uh, that truly uh, cannot be overstated. And as we um, view the McNulty Prize, it's not just celebrating very effective solutions, but it's also honoring those individuals who uh, humble us with their extraordinary courage uh, and passion. And so I think that the McNulty Prize, so very, very well named for a remarkable individual, shows the power of individuals to make a difference. And so now I look forward very much to hearing what this year's laureates um, are um, going to do and how we hear about all the differences they will make to make this a better world where there is not harm and there is justice. Thank you. Johnny, you want to... Thank you, Secretary Albright. Uh, and I'm Johnny McNulty. Um, and it is my pleasure to now invite this year's laureates to the stage. Uh, just off the plane from South Africa, uh, Nicola Golombic, founder of Harambi Youth Employment Accelerator. And Brett Jenks of Fish Forever. Gisela Sanchez of Nutrivita. And Andrew Cassoy, one of the three founders of B Lab. Uh, 
Uh, and again, I'd just like to congratulate all the laureates, and now I would like to welcome Dele Elogide, who will lead these excellent traders to their own class in a panel discussion. <laughs> So another round of applause for this very fine fellows, Gisela, Andrew, and Brett, and Nicola. Nicola, you just got off the plane about an hour ago. Uh, so forgive uh, Nicola if uh, she's a little incoherent. Uh, <laughs> but I'll start with you anyway. Um, Always rely on daily. So tell us a little bit about your project in your own words, and about yourself, and how you got into it. Um, well, hello to everybody. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. Um, Harambi is an initiative to shift the labor market in South Africa. I mean, hopefully it, in some small way, sort of rises to the challenge that we heard about earlier. Um, I, I, it, it really is, is an initiative to say, can we mobilize change both on the demand and the supply side in a society where 50% of young people face the prospect of long-term unemployment? And the reason they do has nothing to do with who they are or what their capabilities are. They have to do with their socioeconomic circumstance and the fact that they are effectively excluded and locked out of the society and the opportunities that the economy presents. And Harambi is an initiative uh, which was started by uh, I was one of the founders, but really we, we decided that our businesses, in, in which we're an investor, should be a demonstration effect that could start a kind of a multiplier effect in, in the labor market of showing that employers can, in fact, bring in first-timers from poor families and that they can succeed and progress uh, in, in, in jobs. Uh, I can say that today, four years later, uh, we've mobilized over 150 private sector employers uh, into the Harambi process. We've partnered with the government and private employers to finance the process, and both transactionally and through social investment. We've supported over 100,000 young work seekers, and 16,000 young people already have permanent full-time jobs as a result of the program. But really, the, those numbers, I mean, I'm going to make the Goldman Sachs joke now, but you know, those numbers are kind of a drop in the ocean. The, the real issue is, are we shifting the labor market? Um, we, we, we're going to support fi uh, 500,000 young people over the next five years. Um, but our, our real measure will be whether employers behave differently at the end of that process and can do that without us. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> so, Brett. Fish Forever. Tell us about Fish Forever. So uh, I run a global environmental organization. It's called RARE. And when I was a Caddo fellow here about five years ago, uh, I got really interested in the idea of tragedy of the commons and the oceans. And so I committed to try to find a solution to one of the most, I guess, under-discussed challenges facing humanity today, in my estimation and that's overfishing. Most of us don't realize that a billion people around the world, billion of the world's poorest, most climate vulnerable people, depend on fish for protein every single day. And yet unknowingly, most local communities throughout the developing tropics, throughout the world, have overfished their local stocks to the point that if we measured them the way we look at a, the gasoline in our car, we've got about a quarter tank left. And we're talking about food for a billion people. The good news is, thanks to a great partnership that we're building with Environmental Defense Fund, my organization RARE, the University of California, Santa Barbara, and the fisheries ministries and countless communities within Mozambique, Belize, Brazil, the Philippines, and Indonesia, we believe we have a solution. The solution's called Fish Forever. And Fish Forever is a pretty simple concept in some ways. There's a three-step process to reducing the tragedy of the commons. Step one is empower local communities in concert with governments to uh, provide exclusive access to their own waters. 
their own fishing grounds. So they treat the ocean not like a place to race to catch the last fish, but a place to be managed like an asset. In exchange for that, step two in the process is that they set aside 20% of their fishing territory as a no-take zone, or what you might call a fish bank, where fish are allowed to get old and big and fat and reproduce, and all that bounty spills over into those exclusive fishing areas. So the better they manage, the better they do. And then finally, to complete this virtuous cycle, because they're now managing the ocean themselves and managing their fisheries, they're able to think about getting a better price and investing in their own fish stocks. And so what has begun to happen, we've seen in 26 pilots along the coast of 26 municipalities in the Philippines, in just one year, a 50% increase in local fish stocks. We're seeing companies now that want to buy Fish Forever fish, and we're seeing governments that are asking us if we would train and build a delivery mechanism to scale this program along the coasts of those first five nations. Small-scale fisheries are a very big opportunity. Big problem, but a big opportunity. And this is a system I believe we can fix. So, uh, Gisela, you, you live in Costa Rica, where poverty is well hidden. <laughs> Even up and down the island, I couldn't see anything. We right? do have. We so do why have. do you settle on this as a project? in an island that seems so sedate and so well ordered? <laughs> um, people think that we don't have any challenges, but we do, actually. Uh, good evening to everybody. I'm really deeply honored to be here, so thank you so much for taking NutriVida as one of the initiatives to consider for the John McNulty Prize. Um, I'm really glad that we have been eating a lot during these few days, <laughs> because I'm, I'm working on food, and actually the lack of food. Uh, malnutrition and undernutrition, which is the lack of micronutrients. Mm -hmm. 800 million people live uh, with this problem around the world. 98% are from developing countries, from countries like Costa Rica or the rest of Central America. And actually the most important victim of this problem are, are children. Uh, almost 50% of the deaths, uh, child deaths, are, are due to undernutrition. So for me, it's a critical challenge that we have to face and that we have to do something about. And that's why I decided two years ago to create NutriVida. It's a social business. It's like creating a, another um, sector of society because we have NGOs, the government, companies, and now we have like a mix between an NGO and a company. Um, it works like a company, but with the huge difference that instead of maximizing profits, it's a company that wants to solve a problem, but using the tools of the market. So what we do is we produce highly nutritious fortified food for people who live in poverty or below the poverty line. And actually we have uh, many distribution channels. One of the most important is a women network. We started with 100 women and now we have 500 in Costa Rica. And our plan is to go from our little country to the rest of Central America, to Haiti, and we hope beyond. Um, I was lucky enough in 2011 to meet Professor Mohamed Yunus, who is the creator of this social business idea. Um, I have to confess that I was his personal stalker, like for a year and a half, <laughs> trying to convince him to join me and be part of NutriVida. And I'm glad to say that he is a member of the board and he has shares in NutriVida, helping us to take this, this concept along. And um, just to finish, I have to say, we have been really lucky to have the support of many AGLN fellows, including Alexandra Kisling, who I, I know is around here, uh, and many others. And uh, up to now, we have been able to, to place 1.5 million highly nutritious uh, meals in, in Costa Rica, and, and we hope that we can grow from there. Actually, I'm a, I'm a small woman from a small country. We only have 4.5 million people, but I have a huge dream, and I feel that uh, I can share with you, and we can imagine that we can eradicate malnutrition from the world together. Thank you. Thank you. So, Nutrivida will be the kind of company that B Labs would like to certify, I would imagine. Right? We'd love Nutrivida to be a B Corp. How does that work? Well, let me just start by saying um, we were a finalist, B Lab was a finalist for the McNulty Prize a number of years ago. Um, 
And when the other candidates were announced and we realized that Dele was one of our competitors, we knew we, knew we were cooked. Uh, and so we thought we'd give it another try this year. And now I'm very inspired by the other people that are up here. And I don't know, Anne, maybe we'll be applying again next year. Um, I'll be nice to you. OK, I appreciate that. Here's the problem we're trying to address. Um, despite, or maybe because of, uh, a period of extraordinary technological innovation um, and economic growth, we live in a society that is plagued by increasing levels of inequality, of environmental degradation, and <clears throat> huge swaths of the population who have been excluded from an opportunity um, to, uh, to pursue economic success. Um, those problems are uh, too many people are wilting. And um, those are problems that in a globalized world can't be addressed just by governments or just by the nonprofit sector. Government, or, or excuse me, the business sector has come to dominate our lives. It represents a massive proportion of GDP in most places around the world. And so if we can't figure out a way for business to address some of our greatest challenges, some can't be addressed by business, but if we can figure out a way for business to address some of our greatest challenges, we may actually be able to solve some huge human problems. Thank you. Um, I just want to say it's, it's, business has an enormous capacity uh, to address many of our great problems at scale because of its ability to attract capital and its ability to attract talent. But it's, I think, more than just that capacity. It's a desire. There is a global culture shift. Many people who are in this room, and many, even more so, many millennials, want to use business in order to create better communities, in order to create better lives for workers, and in order to, um, in, in order to solve big environmental problems. And, and that's why we created B Lab, and that's why we've built the the B Corp movement, which has an incredible amount of um, momentum, and it was and it was really started here um, at the Aspen Institute. So, I hear from <laughs> one common thread from all of you is you seem to have had to work with other people. You are not lone geniuses uh, <laughs> descending from Mount Olympus. So. You are bred. I was particularly fascinated that you went after some institutions to come into this project with you. Because what you are trying to do, it seems to me, is well nigh an impossibility. If you are starting up, right? You take out the piece of paper. I'm now tackling something that's impossible. Why did you bring in those partners? And what do they bring to the table for you? It's a great question. We, so it's so a two-part answer first. Before we even decided how we would approach this, before we even picked uh, partners, we actually scoured the planet. We, we offered up a $20,000 prize. We created an online prize competition called Solution Search. And we said, we want to find winners, people, communities that have already addressed overfishing, who, who at least think they have and, and have some yeah. evidence of proof. In six weeks, we heard from 103 communities in 48 different countries. And so we had the great opportunity to sort of pick the steel, really, you know, borrow, beg, uh, to get the best ideas from a whole bunch of communities mm -hmm. all over the planet. And then we reached out to Environmental Defense Fund because they've helped reform fisheries in the United States, uh, and to University of California, Santa Barbara, because they're some of the most creative combinations of economists and ecologists literally in the world. Mm -hmm. And we said, we've got this big idea. And they said, you guys are absolutely crazy. So we're in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, uh, Nicola, um, you're, you're, you're dealing with a particularly hard uh, challenge. South Africa has a nearly hopeless uh, unemployment situation uh, amongst youth who are almost unemployable because of their recent history, right? So how do you go about trying to solve that? Um, and what would it look like to you when you think you're succeeding? Succeeding, not succeeded. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that um, you know, our, our starting point was to really take stock of the enormity of the challenge. 
um, and to say, it's not just to understand the enormity of the challenge, but to understand it in real time, to say, you know, if one looks at this as a generation of young people, um, you know, that's a five to ten year process. That, that is not never, never land or some other place, some other time. And what would a solution look like that is proportional to the problem? So, I mean, a lot of our thinking emerged out of that question. Um, and it very soon became apparent that um, one, to solve the problem, one had to attack, tackle it systemically. So there was no one thing that you could do. There were a bunch of things that needed to happen almost simultaneously. And what um, are those things? So a combination of employers having a change of mindset on a quite a significant scale. Mm -hmm. So we needed volume, tipping point kind of activity across employers. Um, we needed young people to step up. Um, and stepping up is hard when no one anywhere in your entire social network, in entire Facebook network, has a job, despite their education, despite all the effort they've put in. You know, if you don't have line of sight of any opportunity, it's very hard to actually step up. So what's the mechanism for that motivation? So what we have found is that uh, you need success to generate success. You need it at scale. You need line of sight. So again, volume was really important because young people needed to see enough young people getting opportunities that looked like them, that felt like them, and that we could get momentum in that process. Um, so a lot of this was about going big quickly, mm -hmm. not starting small, not piloting. We call it piloting at scale. Um, so so and, remind uh, us of those numbers again, 16,000. Well, 16,000 people ha have got permanently employed. Mm -hmm. About 120,000 young people are in our network of young people who are what we call getting closer to the labor market. Mm -hmm. So they have stepped up. They are progressing themselves in different ways. They're kind of redoing some maths through the, you know, on con, but in a network of people that encourages and supports them to get their maths to a point where they can meet the retailer's job requirements. Um, they're practicing English. They're um, sort of learning to socialize themselves for the world of work. There's a whole range of initiatives across the country um, which we've mobilized um, young people into. Um, peer networks are very important in that process. Um, and then 150 employers across 10 sectors, uh, because you need the diversification across the economy to fit and match young people into jobs that they're likely to succeed in and progress in. So it's a kind of big mobilization process, really. Okay. So, Gisela, you, you give this food uh, as a highly discounted rate to the poor. Um, how do you sustain the enterprise? Um, it's, it's like a regular company. Uh, we don't give away the products, we sell it, but we sell it almost at cost. So we have a, like a 5% to 7% margin. And with that, actually we're not yet in break even, but we hope we will be um, in the next months. And it's because of the volume that, that we are actually selling that we can get there. We have uh, not an, an amount of, a significant amount of employees. Mm -hmm. So it's not a high paycheck. And, uh, and it's coming along. Actually, we have been facing a lot of competition. Uh, the difference between social businesses in places like Bangladesh and our social business is that we have to compete with regular companies. Mm -hmm. And actually, my, my father told me, you know, this is gonna, going to destroy economic value because you are competing <laughs> with a lower price. And I said, thank God, because there are too many companies doing a lot of like, money, um, making a lot of money, and we need to change the system and have other competitors doing different things. Mm -hmm. So it has been um, an interesting journey with a lot of support from so many people, like from the government, who um, showed us how to fortify food with the right micronutrients. Mm -hmm. And we feel that it's a matter of finding the right fortification vehicles. For, our, for us, those are not like food, food categories, mm -hmm. but things that people like, they're easy to prepare, like they are cheap enough and taste good right. because they have to buy it. So that's the, 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 so, the trick. So the government is an ally for you. Absolutely. Now, what's the role of the government? Many roles. Uh, the most important is the, the Ministry of Health, mm -hmm. who has been supporting us to understand what are the challenges, the, the nutrition challenges of Costa Rica, 
uh, in terms of lack of zinc, iron. Uh, you, you told at the beginning that we don't have any challenges in our little country, <laughs> but we do, actually. 20% of our people live below the poverty line, 7% in extreme poverty. And uh, one of the, the key points out of our anthropological study was that uh, many people don't have enough money to have three meals per day. So we created like a bundle of two products, the soup and the beverage, so they can have a whole meal for a really cheap price. And it, stay, it tastes good, so they like it and they buy it. That's, that's the good part. Thank you. So Andrew, um, we had you on stage yesterday. And so we're not going to ask you too many questions about the specific nature of your project. But I'd like you to talk more about the imperative for at attacking structural problems, which seems to be what B-Labs is trying to do. Because Anand has ruined my afternoon by throwing this challenge down. <laughs> I mean, we, we come from uh, the cultures that we come from that say that you saves one child, saves the world, but maybe, well, in the four, 300,000 children have died, right? Uh, that does not make it any less true, but it represents a contradiction, right? Uh, we want to make a dent in the challenges that face the world. Well, how many dents you will be making? Is this only one dent? So how do you go about trying to tackle things systemically, and what unique challenges do those present? So I have to say that, um, Anand sort of threw me off my game as I was sitting here thinking about whether what we're doing uh, is really both uh, is at a systemic level um, ensuring both that business does no harm, but, but actually even more, that business actually um, can have a mission at its core to create positive impact in society. Not, not, not to give away money after the fact, um, but to actually, for the business itself, to have a positive impact on society. And, um, and that is a, that's a systemic mm -hmm. uh, issue. It, it, it involves, I think, a couple of things. Um, we live in a world where um, every time you open up a magazine, every business is a good business. They're all full of every, every ad you see, no matter what the company does, is for, uh, you know, has windmills and solar panels and <laughs> usually an African farmer holding mm -hmm. some fertile earth. Uh, nice babies <laughs> blowing bubbles. Yeah, and, and you know, and, it, and, and so how's anybody to know the difference between a good company and good marketing? How's anybody to know um, if a company is just doing one good thing, like uh, maybe they're growing organic lettuce, but um, their workers are being treated just as horribly mm -hmm. as every other big ag company treats their workers. Mm -hmm. And so um, that is about creating standards that are credible and global and comprehensive that look at the whole business. Um, and so that's one major piece of, uh, of addressing uh, a systemic problem. The second thing is that the, the, the laws that drive the way we do business, not just here in the US, but in many countries around the world, say that the duty of the directors and the officers of the company is to maximize value for shareholders. And so if that's what the law says, that's what they'll do. We'll get the system that we've built. We'll get the, we'll get the results that we've asked for. Um, and so the second part, we, we believe, of um, changing the system is to change the law, to change the law of fiduciary duty so that when people are making decisions in the boardroom, it's no longer, oh, we can't talk about that, but actually, we have to talk about that because that is the purpose of the business. And it's that change in the purpose of business that I think gives us the opportunity to change the impact that business can have on society. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. So, Nicola, you, you are beating against the current, as, it, as the saying goes, right? I mean, you have a country where even if somebody wants to, wants to hire someone, the skill is not there. Because you have a, a mismatched economy, uh, an economy that's built like a European country's mm -hmm. economy, and a population that is a third world population, right? So there are these big structural things that perhaps in order to solve them, I and mean, people talk about labor market inflexibility, mm -hmm. uh, they talk about government policy, they talk about you know, large corporations keeping their, 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 their profits abroad and all of that stuff, mm -hmm. right? 
So if you're faced with that kind of challenge, which has essentially trapped about 50% of your young people, right? 16,000 full-time jobs begin to look like a, a pinprick. Mm -hmm. So what does that do to you when you think about the challenge of this? Um, well, it, 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 it only spurs me on and excites me because I think we're, we've tapped into a vein. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, I mean, listen, th there are so many things that, you know, in a, in a big system, there are many, many dependencies and things that go wrong and right. So to stay sort of a believer is hard every day. So let me just start there. But um, I think that, um, you know, one has to find the things that are going to shift things quite dramatically. So one of them, for example, is, I mean, one of the, whether you see it as positive or negative, is that jobs are changing, right? So. We have very archaic education systems and qualification systems that don't match what actually jobs require. Mm -hmm. And if one can just somehow get employers to get out of their comfort zone of the traditional ways in which they assess people to determine the potential of young people, and if they can, can use new proxies, you can really shift and tilt who gets access to opportunities in an economy. Um, the, the, you know, there are lots of opportunities in, in, in a growing economy, in African economies. The question is, can you change the queue as to who's going to get those opportunities? And new proxies can do that, new proxies for what we call potential. And the truth is that you know, young Africans who live in poor communities have problem-solving skills and resourcefulness and ingenuity in spades. And if you ask any employer globally, what does the new economy require of entry-level employees, they will list those three things. Right. So the question is, how do you, how do you shift? How do you change? So, so I look at the 16,000 as, as I say, it's just, it's just a kind of demonstration effect. It's a bit of momentum. It's, it's, it's the things that allow us to then change some real systemic things, like, for example, qualifications, frameworks, what gets used by employers to decide who comes in and who stays out. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. So, Brett, you, uh, you're, you're taking a fairly localized approach to uh, solving these problems. But we also know, like the kind of problem Nicola faces, that there are these giant trawlers that are operating illegally on all the coastal water, uh, waters of these uh, poorly governed countries. So the coast of West Africa, the Gulf of Guinea, um, and, and uh, the, the coastal waters of South Asia and so on. All these giant trawlers just go and, and vacuum everything, right? So that this represents a counterpoint to the work you are doing. I mean, the New York Times had a series, I think it was last week, on just outright criminality of the ISIS, right? How does that affect the way you think about your own project? Or are you just you know, saying to yourself, as Voltaire said, do not let the best be the enemy of the good? Well, it's a great question. It was a, it was a great series in the New York Times. I think what's so amazing about it is that it highlights the, the struggle between one NGO and one boat captain. And I think what that shows you is, this, is, is, is the way you can attack the problem of the high seas. When we think about overfishing globally, it's fair to say that the high seas and the trawlers is what gets all the press. But it's not all the fish, and it's not the fish that those billion really poor people depend on. That's the fish within a couple of miles of their coastline where we've got a quarter tank left. There's a, there's a way, we are myopically focused on those nearshore waters in the short term for a couple of reasons. One, because we think we can make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Second, because the problem of the high seas is already being addressed. You know, you, you see a four-part series about slavery and, and, and one trawling captain in the, in the Times, and what that shows you is we're getting very close to knowing exactly how to solve that problem, right? There's a lot of technology now. There's nonprofit organizations working with Google, working with governments, and you can basically see where all the big ships are all over the world all the time, and you can actually tell which ones throw it in reverse and trawl. And then you can figure out where they take their fish. So that actually is the least of our worries, I would argue. 
People still need to keep working on it, but we're much closer. And that's, most people don't get that. The big challenge is figuring out how to change the system so that rather than having a tragedy of the commons throughout the ocean, you can actually create a, a system where the people who depend on the resources have not just a say, but actually some right to determine how it gets managed, Good. how they can feed themselves, and how they can safeguard the natural resources, not just the fish, but the reefs, the seagrass beds, on which their uh, climate futures depend. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what does success look like? How do you know you're winning? How do you measure yourself? How do you know you're winning? Any of you can answer that. I can, I can take, take the chance. Uh, for me, maybe it's more concrete because I know how many people are living below the poverty line. I know that I'm now targeting only 1% of mm -hmm. those, uh, these people and I want to get to all of them. So that's one of the measures. The, the other one is nutritional you impact. You have a time frame for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it depends on the country. For example, for Haiti, that was uh, one of the reasons uh, Professor Yunus joined us to, to do this. He thought that Central America was not in need enough, so Haiti was a, a, a key component. Uh, it's gonna take a lot of time, because people in, in Haiti are not necessarily used to buy stuff. So they, they are receiving so many things um, for free that it, it will be more difficult for, for us so to do it there. So you went and recruited someone to make your life more difficult. <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, um, we are trying to focus our attention in, the, in a concept called the 1,000 days window. Mm -hmm. And it's a simple but powerful concept that starts when your mother was pregnant up to when you were two years old. And people have to know that that's the most critical period of, of your life in terms of nutrition. Mm -hmm. So if you have limited resources, we have to try to put everything in, into that window in order to have all of these kids um, with the opportunity to grow to their full maximum genetic potential. So we are trying to get all of our energy in this, this 1,000 days window. And we hoped that in a few years, and, and we really hope it's, it's possible, we can eradicate um, undernutrition in the region, in Central America, and we hope beyond that. Thank you. Nick, Nicola? Um, so we have a, a, a bunch of measures that we track uh, around employer behavior. Um, we have targets around households that are receiving their first sustainable income and the transformation and network effect that that has on those households, and we track um, the impact on young people, I mean, both you know, literal impact of, of various transitions, um, but also their, uh, their sense of empowerment and, um, and hope in they, they what we call future orientation. And we think that if we can kind of track a number of those and catapult a number of those significantly forward, we, we're, we have a chance of creating a more inclusive economy over the next five years. Okay, so uh, let's actually set success aside. Suppose you fail. Does, does it worry you? Have you thought about that? You just fail completely. Brett. Well, if we fail, we will probably go out of business as a nonprofit uh, NGO. Um, we may fail, but um, that's kind of why we're here. I think we're, we're, we're taking some measures to make sure that if we fail, we fail very quickly and we learn very quickly and we wiggle our way into success. But when we count fish stocks year after year, and when we begin to look at livelihoods in those communities, and then we begin to see fisheries ministers signing up to, to replicate, and then eventually when we get to see finance ministers saying, guess what, we need this nationwide, here's how we're gonna figure out how to finance it, then we'll definitely know we're on the right track. And you, Andrew, um, you know, are you worried sometimes when you're kind of alone that this might just be a fad and, and B-Labs might just be another thing that vanishes into the ether? Yeah, every day. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, for two reasons. Um, one, uh, the, the alternative, uh, like the alternative is pretty bad. The alternative, if we don't uh, do business in a different way, mm -hmm. Um, I don't see how the world solves 
many of the greatest challenges that it faces. The, the ca capitalism is too big a force uh, for us to, fig not to, to for, for us to fail to figure out. And so, um, usually when I think about uh, us failing, my hope is that there's somebody else who just comes up with a better model mm -hmm. or is better at executing than we are. Mm -hmm. Because um, somebody has to solve this problem of um, the evolution of capitalism. Ladies and gentlemen, Andrew, Gisela, Brett, and Nicola. Congratulations again.